percent. Quite. No, I'm I'm kidding, of course. See, I can't act old. Like, when you get past your second millennia, you stop gaining the ability to act old. It's insane. Um, but I, I don't I don't even know how to comment on this episode because it's not bad. It's just unenjoyable for me. Anyone else out there kind of get that? Like, it's it's hard to point to things and say demonstrably that's bad, except for two. There's two things I could point out that are demonstrably bad about the episode. And the rest of it's just kind of... weird. This episode was written by David Harmon. You may recognize him as the one who put forth the story idea for A Piece of the Action, an episode I remember liking. Why does my mice keep, mice keep doing that? Sorry. And uh, so that's just, that's not exactly an encouraging thing. Pevney directed it, of course. And, well, if you don't remember this episode, this is the one where they all get older, and Commodore Idiot is a moron. But he shouldn't be. Like, there's no reason for this. So let, let's just run through this. So first, Chekhov freaks out. As he goes down to the planet, he's like, Oh my god, a body! It's almost like I've never encountered a body before! Apparently, um, Walter Koenig actually had issue with that scene. He thought it was irritating to act, in his own words, like a teenager, rather than like a person who is on the bridge of the... Well, actually, I don't know if the Enterprise is the flagship, but a starship. I mean, there's no denying the Enterprise is a prestigious prestigious starship, and Chekhov is good enough to be on its bridge. Why is he freaking out over a corpse? I'm with him on that, so that's ding number one. Ding! Then we have the elderly couple show up. Now, this isn't a complaint about the episode. Actually, both actors do a pretty decent job of their role. It's just they're old. The actors are, I mean. They're actually old. <laughs> um, the, the aging makeup in this episode is not good, is what I'm trying to say. Now, I'm not going to necessarily hold that against it in the same vein as I would certain other things, because technology, the times, limitations of budget, I get all that, I do. But I do have to point out that the bad aging makeup does detract from the episode's overall quality. This is doubly worse, made worse, because only one of the actors actually does a decent job. Eh, let me rewind that. Two of the actors do a decent job of acting old. Uh, one of them is Leonard Nimoy. He does a more understated impression, but I'll, I'll give him credit. And then there's DeForest Kelly, who does an amazing job. He actually is probably the only person who sounds and acts like he's actually getting older throughout the episode. Does a great job of it. This is funny, considering Encounter at Farpoint. <laughs> but he does. I, I'm not, I, I do actually give legitimate praise to the actor. He, he nails his role. It's just everyone else doesn't. I know that we all make fun of Shatner's acting, but as I've said many times, I have seen that man act. I don't think he has range. I think that's really what it is. And he, he doesn't do a good job here at all. Uh, in fact, there's a quote. It's, it's a very long, meandering quote. I bookmarked it, though, just so I could share it with you. This is from Pevney, the director. This is a show about... Um, <laughs> talking with uh, DeForest Kelly, and we had a thing on the stage after the makeup was applied when he said, Bill, I can't do that. That should be me. Or, excuse me, Bill can't do that. That should be me. I tried to explain to him the situation. He was playing this old man and doing quite well, incidentally. I agree. And Bill, I think, was maybe copying some of the things DeForest did to give him an aged look, because Bill was not very good as an old man. DeForest was beautiful in the role. The big problem, of course, was time, and two or three hours later I would get in my first take. It was just ridiculous. It was just a gimmick on the show. Who the hell cared if the wig wasn't precisely wrinkled in the right place? Nobody's going to know. I mean, yeah, if you're in motion picture, spend a day, but you can't do that in television. But the actors no longer cared about schedules. I never got a show off schedule, but I heard about them going off schedule, and after a while, the show just became too costly. Now, I'm not going to say if I agree or disagree with that, because, uh, well, because both, to be completely blunt. Because he's got a point. As I've said before, I actually have a lot of sympathy and... and just empathy for the nature of them and their schedule and a budget and how limited they were and what they could do. And at the same time, his comments really show that for him, this was mostly about the job, not about the art. And both are valid points. Both need to be there. I've said this so many times, you need a good producer. You need good... You need someone who knows how to handle the practical, pragmatic side. And you need people who know how to handle the creative... Uh, 
more freeform side of things in order to make a truly good product. It's very rare we actually get both of those things. Most of the time in real life we get accidents like this show. But anyways, I, I, my point is I don't want to come down on Pevney either way. I was just sharing his thoughts on, uh, you know, Shatner's acting. <clears throat> but Shatner's acting aside, it's actually interesting because we now have seen him as old as he is supposed to be in this episode. The stated age, even. In fact, he's older. What's funny is I think Shatner looks better in, in real life than he did here with his makeup. But then again, we saw the same thing with Nimoy, kind of. Obviously, not necessarily because Nimoy was the Vulcan thing, but still. Anyways, I'm getting off topic at this point. See? See? It's a catchphrase. It's not a catchphrase. I, I do I do that in real life, just discussion. I don't know if you're aware of this. The way I talk here is how I talk to people in person. I mean, I'm talking to a little black box there instead of a human being who is sitting next to me. But the overall approach I use is pretty much the same. The only difference is here I try to talk without interruption because obviously there's no one talking back. That's That's the big difference right there. This is a good time to, speaking of, this is a good time to complain about the audio in this episode. It's weird. It feels like they used noise cancellation with a weird attack vector. So, now, on the off chance you don't know what that means, or I'm using the wrong words, which is entirely possible. It's most of the audio editing I, I do, I just do with, you know, practice and, and templates I've set up. I don't know any of the proper terminology. It sounds like they're muting parts of the audio, and then they demute it for the people talking, but this demute... Uh, phase here is too slow. So, I'm in like that. And it just sort of comes in and back. You know, it just kind of fades in and out. Weirdly noticeably, this happens in multiple scenes in this episode. Very strange. Uh, so at 11 minutes into the episode, there's no build-up. There's no build-up. At 11 minutes, we know they're getting older. And we know that that's, that's what's happening. And that's the extent of it. Okay. So that torpedoes any possibility of a mystery. Uh, you're, if you're wondering what I mean by that, one of the things I like to do is try to figure out the structure of an episode. What's it going for? Is it about the tension? Is it about the character? Is it about the consequence? Is it about the resolution? Is it about the mystery? Most Star Trek episodes, honestly, most episodes of most television, would fall into one of these categories, and I might have missed a few there. This is not a mystery episode. It's also not a character episode. And there's no tension. And the resolution doesn't come until, like, the second-to-last scene in the episode. So what is this episode? And this is my core point. I can't figure out what the point of this episode is. I know that sounds strange, but I mean... You know, I mean, you could probably think, Lore, it just has to be entertaining, not good. Or, <laughs> I'm saying that wrong. It doesn't have to be entertaining. It doesn't have to follow a structure. And you're absolutely right. But this episode isn't entertaining for me. So... Why is that? And that's my overall point. I'm trying to analyze the why. I could just say, well, this episode sucks, and be done with it. But I think this lack of structure is part of why I think it sucks. Because it just sort of takes its time and does what I'm doing in real life very deliberately here, and meandering to the actual point. And then it just suddenly rushes through, and it's like, oh, it's done. So the audio's weird. The, temp the tempo and pacing are just all over the place. There is no real point. There's this really strange scene where there's actually kind of a horrible line uh, where Kirk is with his one true love. No, I'm just kidding. This isn't Edith Keeler. Uh, by the way, I've recently, since I, since I covered City of the Age of Ever, I happened to come across a completely unrelated interview, well, semi-unrelated interview, by uh, D.C. Fontana. And she actually mentioned that in the writer's room, Edith Keeler was supposed to be the one true love for Kirk. So I guess that's where that idea came from that a lot of the, uh, the other book writers took and ran with. But anyways... Getting off topic. There's this bit where Kirk approaches one of his old flames. I think this is at least three we've seen so far. I, I think I'm actually missing a few there. And she's like, we should totally get back together. And he's like, okay, why now? Look at me. How much older was your last husband? 26 years. <sighs> Uh, okay, that's, that's a thing. And, of course, he's aging, and so the implication is obvious and kind of messed up. Then he gives the line, is this love? What are you offering me, love or a going-away present? Now, I'm going to rewind a second here, because that is all kinds of messed up. Um, 
here's the catch, because there is a catch there. If you're in your 20s or 30s, which she is implied to be, and you're into people in their, I guess that would be 40s and 50s, okay, I guess, like, I don't get that per se, but then again, I'm into older women too, so I suppose I do get that. How much older than me is Gates McFadden now? That's a good question. My point is, no judgment, right? Like, as long as you're both consensual adults and safe, sane, consensual, you know, the big three, sure, okay. So her having a type isn't necessarily all that out of bounds, and obviously she did have some care for Kirk, even when he wasn't older, so obviously there's something else here, some emotional connection that is not just physical attraction. Okay. Him taking offense at it is kind of strange, and frankly out of place. In fact, his actual last statement there, in my opinion, is actually rude. Why? Well, first of all, uh, Kirk, there's a pretty good chance you'll be dying inside of a week. She might literally be offering you a going-away present. It is still legitimate. There's nothing wrong with that. But that is something she might actually be offering you. So how about you not be a dick to her about it? Just a thought. This is also a good time to mention, I've said so, 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 so many times that Star Trek lives and breathes on its guest stars, and both guest stars here, which is Charles Drake, who plays Commander St Commodore Stalker, and Sarah Marshall, who plays Janet, suck. But he plays his character completely straight-faced to the point where it feels like he's just struggling to recite his lines at all the times, and all he's really doing is trying to make sure that he maintains the general recitation of the lines rather than adding any actual acting ability to them which I suppose could be a thing, but there's not really much there to talk about, given the fact that he almost has this one uninterrupted tone every time he talks. Which can work for some things, but it just comes across as flat. I suppose that's the point. He's a pencil pusher, right? That's why he's a Commodore. Actually, funny story, if you've been paying attention, and this is already true. You remember uh, back in Court Martial, Kirk was being offered a Commodore ship, and it was being treated like a demotion, even though Commodore is above Captain. Why? Well, that makes perfect sense. Commodores are in charge of lesser things. It's a higher rank, but it's also someone who is, uh, let's, let's say, less, less a part of the line. Let's put it that way. And this is actually already an established part of TOS, which is why I feel safe bringing it up here. Anyways. <clears throat> yeah, their, their acting is not great, and Kirk is just being weird and rude, and this then leads to poor Chekhov in one of the, it would have only two good scenes in the whole episode. Take this check off. Do this check off. If this ends up, go, keep going on. And run out of samples. <laughs> that amused me. Then there's this weird bit where Kirk goes to the bridge and is embarrassed for a while because he's old and forgetting things. I don't know what to make of this scene. On the one hand, it feels like it's a deep dramatic piece. You know, like someone losing their memory would be a big dramatic horrible thing because it would be. On the other hand, it feels like it's being played for comedy because the music can't seem to decide if it wants to be more dramatic and sad or comedic. Da, 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 da. You know, you know, you know the tone, right? I'm sure you can hear it here right now. Da, 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 da. Well, okay then. No, it it can't seem to decide. It does the meandering thing. It does the flip flopping thing, and then the scene ends, and it's just weird. I don't know what to make of it. This is a good time to mention the double scan thing. Now. I screwed up uh, some time ago. This is last year, by, by current standards. The episode The Man Trap. Jimmy's just dead, and I don't know why. I've already scanned everything I can. Like, five, six minutes later, Jim, I've discovered he's actually died because all the salt was removed from his body. Now, I made fun of that in my rumination of that episode. But it didn't even occur to me that was actually a first that I forgot to notate. I mention it because the fur it shows up here as well. See, that is a really long-standing trick uh, cliche, and I have to admit I haven't commented on it much, and I'm not sure why because it's really egregious every time it shows up. I am, of course, referring to the trek cliche of the double scan. You scan once, nope, nothing's going on. Then you scan a second time. <gasps> I've discovered the problem. I'm sure you could think of a dozen examples of this right off the top of your head. I got one right now. Star Trek Nemesis. Scan, scan. Yeah, he's your clone. Scan, scan. Oh, he's dying. <laughs> like, there's several, several, several examples of this. And again, this is not the first time this has shown up even in TOS. We've scanned everything, but now we've scanned the comet a second time, and now we've discovered that it's the thing. And 
You get the point. It's almost always done to try and make it so that the information isn't revealed too early. That's its purpose in the narrative. And that kind of is stupid. When you have access to scanners, they should work. I'm sorry to, to be a stickler about this one, but it is aggravating every time they apply this one, especially when they apply it badly, like they do here. Especially given they already figured out the disease thing within the first 11 minutes. And then, well, normally this would lead to a buildup. Remember I mentioned one of the parts, purposes of an episode can be the solution. How do we resolve the conflict, the dilemma, if you will. Although dilemma episodes are different, so let's, let's distinct that. So, how do we resolve the conflict? The resolution in this episode happens in the second to last scene, as I already mentioned. There's no build-up to it whatsoever. None. So this isn't a solution episode. This isn't a how-do-we-solve-it episode, which revealing this, the common thing earlier might have led to a build-up to that. Instead, it's just, nope. So once again, I have no idea what's going on with this episode. So this is when Stalker decides to waste our time. By the way, this is a one-off. I'm just going to go ahead and tell you that, or a one-step if you prefer. Stalker uh, decides to say that it is a disaster to have anything less than a perfect captain of a starship, which, considering some of the starship captains we have and will meet, even just in this show, that's saying something. I could also reference the Valiant over on DS9. I know that's a bad example, but point remains. Then Stalk Stalker argues Spock needs to go away. Or, excuse me, no, Spock needs to replace the captain. Spock says, no, I can't. And he says, well, then obviously, you, Kirk can't, because if you can't, and you're half Vulcan, and his logic is absolutely sound. This is all completely logical and perfect sense-making. And then for some reason, Spock says, no, I'm not going to re relieve the command. Why? Then, that makes Stalker insist on the hearing. Okay. This then leads to Galway dying. No, Red Shirt died. I know she was wearing blue. It's treated exactly like that. Nobody even really reacts. Oh, she's dead, and we're going to be dead too. That That is the Red Shirt concept. When the death is meaningless and pointless, and it's only there to show that the situation is serious. It is trite, dumb, and stupid. I'm not saying a, the death of a secondary character or a tertiary character, or even a nameless character, can't be done right. Star Trek actually has done that right several times. That's why I call out the Red Shirt concept. It's only a redshirt concept if it's dumb and stupid as applied here. With me? Cool. So then at 26 minutes and 20 seconds into the episode, we start the hearing. I really don't like this hearing. Now, I said that, you know, I have trouble demonstrably proving why this episode is bad. This is a scene where I can demonstrably prove, prove that this is bad. First of all, Kirk is stubborn and stodgy and tragic or funny. Once again, the episode can't decide which tone it wants to go for, and everyone seems willing to cover for him, and everyone seems super embarrassed by this. Why? I, I, if I'm not making my point clear enough, allow me to elucidate. If the captain had just been... Oh, what's a good parallel? Stricken by a terrible disease which prevents him from moving. He's paralyzed from the waist down. And now, well, no, see, that's not quite good. Um, let's say the captain's struck by a horrible disease which gives him terrible headaches and makes him cough and sneeze all the time. You, you may have heard of it before, okay? So he's having trouble functioning. If the captain was thusly sick and couldn't be cured for whatever reason, do you think everyone would be all super embarrassed and be like, no, we can't relieve him temporarily because... No, it's just, I mean, he's, he's fine. You notice how during the hearing, everyone tries to cover for him. Why? He's sick with something. We find out later it's radiation, which is so many levels of nonsense, I'm not even going to cover that. So he's sick. Why is this a big deal? Kirk himself, as I mentioned earlier, is portrayed as simultaneously tragic and humorous, which I don't even know what they're going for on that one. Allow me to share a quote. Tragedy is cutting your hand. Comedy is stumbling into an open manhole and dying. <laughs> and I point that out because I could see how they might have wanted to try to go for both, but I do feel like they failed miserably. Oh yeah, I was going to share a quote. I believe it's in Hyang. Yes. Uh, Deadly Years. I was inspired to write... This is by the, the writer. 
I was inspired to write the script by examining the American syndrome versus the oriental reverence of old age. The concept of youth and beauty is such a shallow one simply because it doesn't last very long. That's the inch of truth I was looking for. How important is it in the overall scheme of things in a person's life, if at all? But we make it important. So that was his point. And I mention that because the script has a lot of vibes of treating this as if they are actually getting old. I know what you're saying, but they are. No, they're not. By every measure, they are not actually getting old. They are being gradually debilitated in a way that mimics old age. I'm with McCoy. He says it beautifully. He is currently experiencing symptoms. I, I didn't write it down the whole quote. He is currently experiencing symptoms that very clearly follow what we would call old age. That is not him getting old. That is, there's none of the reverence there. There's none of the whether youth or beauty thing matters. And none of the significance of what it feels like the author was going for is actually present on camera, except the script keeps trying to reinforce that significance that's not there. And I think, this is speculation, I think that's why the episode just kind of feels so bipolar between its two tones. Either way, then everyone bends over backwards for Kirk. I already mentioned that, yada, yada, yada. Let's lead ourselves to problem number two, repetition. They decide to give evidence. All of the evidence given is stuff we've already seen on camera. Why? In case you're missing the point here, this is straight up padding. Because if you wanted the court scene for, scene for some reason, I'm not sure why, but if you wanted it for whatever reason, what you would probably want to do is either have it be a backdrop thing, in other words, something you cut away from periodically, or maybe you need it there for the budget. We've already established it's really cheap and easy to do uh, the court scenes. That, that's an established thing. Budget's a problem. Keeping it under budget's a problem. Making sure you have shorter shoots is a problem. Okay, so you need it for real-life practicality purposes. Okay, I'm okay with that. I am. Make something in the scene worth a damn. Reference incidents that haven't been shown on camera. Show evidence of things that are even worse than what we've already perceived. Mention personal inferences about the competency, which they're not really sure about. There's plenty of things you can do with this that don't involve literally saying out loud scenes we have already seen in this very episode. This is, again, why I say this is demonstrably bad. Because this is, <laughs> this is straight up repetition with nothing new added. In fact, several things taken away, if we're being blunt. This is showing and then telling. <sighs> and yes, I bothered to deliberately repeat my point several points there, several times there to make a point. Let me also further add, you're probably thinking, Laura, it's just one scene that's 9 minutes and 27 seconds long. It's almost a fifth of the entire episode is devoted to this one seat of padding. Okay, so the episode is pretty crap so far. It's not that, it, it doesn't have that extra little oomph to go into lamentation status, but I'm not done bragging on it, because the next thing we find out is they're near the neutral zone. Actually, this was mentioned much earlier. In fact, funny thing, they even mention Gamma Hydra, which if you don't understand why I'm bringing it up, the Kobayashi Maru specifically involves going into the neutral zone near Gamma Hydra 4, I think. Might have been 2, I'm not sure. <laughs> I, uh... I mean, it's Klingons instead of Romulans, but, you know, points, points. So the stalker takes over. Why? Don't give me the rank thing. <laughs> In fact, he said, Spock thought it says, someone else should actually take command instead of you. You have no experience. And he said, you'd have a younger man who doesn't have my wealth of experience? You yourself have admitted that you're a line pusher. You, or, oh, actually, I just he didn't admit that. You yourself admitted you have no com command experience. He is a Commodore, which as we've already established is someone who's, you know, not a line officer in practic practical application. I mean, you might as well just call that a different branch at that point. He also is wearing a red uniform, which is operations. I just feel like pointing that out while we're on the subject. Um, you know who's wearing a gold uniform who could take over? Sulu. By the way, just to really make my point, again, I'm trying not to look at future stuff where we know Sulu's a good captain and gets his own frickin' ship. Sulu has already been in command of the Enterprise up to this point in time. So that's already an established thing. To be perfectly blunt, I would probably trust Chekhov over this Yahoo. So, I, I, I'm probably not doing a good job 
of making my point here, but there is no reason for this guy to take command. It is, it w I would literally pick Uhura over him. And I suppose that's actually not saying much because she's a, she's a line officer too. Um, I would pick, you know what, okay. I would pick McCoy over this guy for command. I know McCoy is not a valid option right now, but I would. This guy is an absolutely terrible commander. McCoy might be pushing it, but I'm trying to make my point here. Yeah, I'd still probably go with McCoy. At least he would know what to do as far as quest requesting information from his people, which Stalker doesn't do at all. So, very, very stupid that he takes command. Then, he decides to go across the neutral zone. Wait. Stop. Okay, so this is every level of stupid. First of all, ignoring the fact that the neutral zone has always been portrayed up till now, remember, that's the continuity we're using, as a nice linear line. The only way, then, for this nice linear line for it to be something that you're going to cross is if you are <laughs> down here. And thus we'll be going across like one of the tips of it, like this. That's assuming it curves. Now, that's something I'm willing to allow. However, if you zoom out the camera and try to envision a situation where this happens, what you're going to have is a situation in which it would actually be just slightly slower to just skirt the neutral zone and go around the edge. The only way for that to not be true is if there is this massively distended bulge in, in the neutral zone that kind of comes out like this. And then it would be substantially slower to actually go around. Now, if we are to be as kind as possible and say that there's this random bulge that there just happened to be behind, fine. Why are you breaking into the neutral zone at all? Remember, Stalker has been shown the entire... I just realized his name is Stalker. The whole episode has been shown to be someone who's a huge stickler for the rules and regulations. I'm pretty sure don't violate the treaty zone in order to potentially provoke an interstellar war is something that he probably would not do. Right? I mean, I, I can't be the only one who would think that might be a thing. This is also a good time to mention, by the way, the in incredulousness that this scientific outpost and his starbase both happen to be this close to the neutral zone for this to even be a qualification. Then, hang on, I'm not done yet. Then he decides, okay, screw the rules, screw interstellar war, this is an extremely important thing. You know what, I'm actually kind of willing to give all of this just because of how inept he is as a captain. But that's the catch, isn't it? If we accept that he is... This stupid, which is the defense I could see for him violating all of these rules in common sense, then he is in no way qualified for command, and Sulu, or Chekhov, or Uhura, should be in charge. Probably closer to Sulu, Uhura, Chekhov in that order. Should be in charge instead of him. By the way, all the people I just mentioned just kind of gape and stare and don't do anything when he fails to give orders, because apparently the idea of I have a crap commander and don't have the ability to make decisions on my own is something that is just a part of being Starfleet, but then again he flat out mentions that everyone on the ship is expendable except for the captain, so maybe the, the idea here is that the captain is absolutely mandatory for the operation of a ship, which, for the record, I disagree with. Oh, don't mistake me. A captain is crucial, but not mandatory. You can't tell me a helmsman can't figure out how to, you know, do evasive maneuvers or get the hell out of Dodge or anything without having someone tell him to do it. And engineering can't figure out how to get energy balance to the shields and blah, blah. There's several just things that people can do on their own that nobody does because they're all just looking at him, gaping, like, what's going on? They, there's even a reaction shot at one point where it's like, what do I do? What do I do? And everyone just has this reaction shot to him. Do your jobs, people! To be clear, I am laying all of this on the writing. This is really dumb writing. Oh yeah, I'm not done complaining about this just yet, because then it's set off at warp 5. Point 1, we've already established at this point that this ship can go warp 8, and that warp 8, while very, very fast and very dangerous, is nevertheless the we-need-to-get-there-right-freaking-now button. You are in such a hurry to, to get to your location, and you're crossing into enemy territory? Go warp 8, not warp 5. This then leads to Spock coming in and informing Kirk that Kirk is relieved. This is, in the episode's defense, this is a better scene than it has any right to be. Because what happens is Kirk is is just laying into him for taking command from him. And, you know, it's all mad, rambling, paranoid, you know, none of it, none of it is real, obviously. Until he finds out that Spock hasn't actually taken command. This is, what I mean by not real is, he doesn't mean it. 
He doesn't actually mean, oh, Spock, you always want to command for yourself. He's just venting. You know what that's like. <laughs> I'd say the last five minutes show what that's like, but you get my point. Although, in my defense, that wasn't venting. I have legitimate grievances of this episode, which is why well, I'm trying to make my point on that. He vents at Spock, and then he finds out that Spock isn't taking it. It's frickin' Stalker. And then he gets actually upset. He would actually have rather Spock taken command from him than Stalker. It's a very small character point that I'm not even sure was deliberate. But it's a, it's, it's a nice little scene. It is then followed by him ranting about how he's not actually old, and he's not getting old, and, it's, and then he turns to his, his old flame, I can't remember her name, um, Janet. He turns to Janet and says, am I getting old? You know, that scene would have a lot more impact if he actually was, in fact, getting old, which, of course, he is not, as we've already discussed. Again, that whole theme about the work. So, at 40 minutes into this stupid episode after having done dozens and dozens of tests on Chekhov to the point where it's actually become a running gag doing tests on Chekhov, then they think, all right, let's think about this logically. We all went down to the planet and everything did, everyone did the exact same things. And within seconds of saying that sentence, Spock's like, well, no, Chekhov ran off to, to freak out. You're right, he froke, freaked out. That's it, adrenaline can defeat radiation, which I'm not even, like I said, I'm, I'm not even touching the magic radiation thing. Let's... Let's just assume that this is the Fallout universe and move on, okay? We can only take the nitpicking so far, especially in TOS. So, okay. We can use it. We've got this. We'll, we'll hit ourselves with adrenaline and it'll stop the radiation from aging us. Okay, I have to bring this up. How are they still being aged despite being way away from the source of the radiation? Why was no one on the ship being aged either since, you know, it had passed through the area? Why was there enough radiation still behind to age people, despite the fact that the comet had long since passed? How did enough of the radiation from the comet get into the planet atmosphere to begin with? You know what? I'm willing to let all of that slide. Magic radiation. Here's one thing I am not willing to let slide at all. Kirk is just young again. What? At least when Pulaski did it, she went into the freaking transporter. Even that was nonsense that I complained about. But this? Imagine just... And then all of a sudden you're young again and your hair stops being gray and, and your wrinkles go away and your faculties return. I, I cannot begin to explain how monumentally no that is. And that's the problem. Because they're trying to undo aging. Except it's not. It would have made more sense, and this is the closest thing to a headcanon I have, by the way. I'm curious of your thoughts on this. It would have made more sense if this was something that was basically putting a dampener on them. So, hear me out for a second. First of all, you could completely nix the physical aging problems. You could completely eject all of the uh, the makeup, right? Just have them aging, aging, quote-unquote, in a way that is preventing them from operating correctly which progresses over time from being capable of thinking straight to being in f command of their faculties to losing their memory to basically going through a very accelerated form of Alzheimer's until they hit the pure dementia point and then their brain stops functioning. Right? So it still kills them. Still has the same danger. We no longer need the makeup. We no longer need the bad physical acting. But we still have all of the threat of the aging and the aging mechanism that can still be there. And when it's cured, all of that blocker is now gone, so the brain is now able to function again. Still doesn't make sense, and I'm willing to acknowledge that, but I think I would have gone with that a lot more, especially since it would have made the show look better and cost less money. Either way, it somehow magically de-ages him. Whatever. Notice McCoy's hair was completely gray, by the way, and now it's completely back to normal. <sighs> Meanwhile... Five to ten Romulan ships have surrounded the Enterprise. They must really patrol their border, because they were on them in seconds of them crossing into the neutral zone. Now that makes sense. They probably saw the Enterprise coming and were ready for them. Um, shouldn't this mean war? We've seen the Romulans are totally willing to uh, not start a war, but react to provocation. That's one of their big shticks, especially in TNG. And it was kind of a thing already in Balance of Terror. So... Shouldn't this lead to, at the very least, a major international incident? 
No? Okay. Never mind. I'll put away all my thoughts about the politics and just kind of fail at making my sound effects here. There we go. Sure. This uh, To continue complaining really quick, I really don't like this episode, by the way. There's a bit where Kirk says, I'll take the first shot. Now, at first I thought it was the recurring trend. I should stop playing with stuff here. At first I thought it was the recurring trend of Kirk being self-sacrificing. No. No, he needs to be on the bridge because he's the captain and no one can do anything of their own volition, as we mentioned earlier. Do we ever wonder why Star Trek V turned out the way it did? I mean, I, I, I hate to say that. I, I, I dismiss Shatner's ego, and I look down at the kind of overly egotistical crap he did, just like everyone else does. But the show certainly didn't help that attitude, did it? Note that Kirk was a successful and, and you know high-priced actor before he went to Star Trek. And by Kirk, I mean Shatner. So then they pull the Corbomite thing. I'll give you that episode. That was good. That, that, that's good. I like that. Um, everyone even grins about it. Even Chekhov, who wasn't there at the time. I kind of dislike that. First of all, there's the long-standing theory of when did Chekhov actually join the crew in lore. Um, Star Trek II Wrath of Khan, we talked about it there. It's worth noting that in a later episode, uh, I, Mud, I believe, he will actually reference not recognizing Mud despite the theory that he was on the ship during Mud's tenure, and there's no way he wouldn't have noticed Mud's women because that was the whole point of that episode. So, I like the other theory. This is something the Star Trek Encyclopedia posited, I believe, that Sulu just leaned over and was like, and explained the Corbomite thing to him, which is why he thought it was funny. So then they get out, and they're free, and everything's cool, and... Kirk gets a moment with Janet. We'll never see her again. And Commodore Stalker has learned that a starship is capable of many amazing things. And you're amazing. Oh, sorry. He, I, just, I got stuck up in the, the, lick boot, the boot licking there. Forgive me. I really don't like this episode. The only thing that prevents this from lamentation status is it doesn't have that extra oomph to really push it. But it is stupid, insulting, badly constructed, boring, and padding. But I really wanted to show my work on this one, which is why I've talked so long about it. I hope you've at least enjoyed my dissertation on this one. Honestly, yeah, I'd put this below Shore Leave. I'm looking at my list here of the skip list, and yeah, this was just bleh. Either way, I'll see you next time, guys. And Either way, I'll see you next... Did I already say that? I can't remember. Well, either way... Uh, hopefully this episode is not quite a lamentation status. But either way, I'll see you next... Wait a second.